it's time for Maths with Mr. Thomas. Hey, hey, we've made it to the end of quadratics. Woo! This is the review lesson. I shall go over all the key points in this lesson, but remember it does not include every single slide and every example. It's just the main parts that you need to know. So if there's anything you're unsure of, you're best going back and looking at the individual lessons. So here we go, a quick recap of quadratics. So remember, we started away back at the start looking at sketching a parabola. And to sketch a parabola, you can look at the coefficient of x squared to decide if the graph is going to be like a smiley face, woo, or a sad face, woo. You want to find where the parabola crosses the y-axis, it does this when x is zero, and it crosses the x-axis, also known as the roots, when y equals zero. You can average the two points to find out the axis of symmetry. Remember, your axis of symmetry will be x equals a number. And you can use that value, use that number, to find out the maximum or minimum turning point. We did a few examples with that. So this example here, the coefficient of x squared is 1, so the graph's going to be like a smiley face. Woohoo! You can find it where it crosses the y-axis. You can find it where it crosses the x-axis, so it'll look something like this. The axis of symmetry is going to be halfway between the two roots. So between 0 and 6, you've got 3. That means your axis of symmetry will be x equals 3. Also, if it is some harder numbers, you just add the two numbers together and half them, and that will give you the axis of symmetry. When x equals 3, then, you can sub that into the original equation to find out y, and that gives you the turning point. We did other examples. In this one, you had the coefficient of x squared was a negative, which means you had a sad face. So it was a sad graph, so it was looking something like that. Again, you can find it where it crosses the y-axis and the x-axis. You can get the axis of symmetry. This one here, you can add the two numbers together, divide by 2, so x would be equal to negative 1. And again, you can work out the turning point. So we spent quite a bit of time on sketching the parabola. This was an example that was maybe a bit trickier. This time we wanted to work out the equation of the parabola in that form, ax squared plus bx plus c, and it passed through these points. Because we know it passed through 3, 0 and negative 2, 0, we know that when y is 0, x would be 3 and negative 2. Meaning then, if we kind of reversed what we did in the last few examples, we could subtract 3 from both sides, so x take 3 is 0, and add 2 to both sides, so x add 2 is 0. Meaning then the parabola would be of the form k bracket, and then we've got x minus 3, x plus 2. Using the other piece of information then, we were also told that when x is 0, y is negative 12, so we can sub in 0 and negative 12 to work out that value of k, and then get the equation of the parabola. After that, we moved on to looking at maximum and minimum turning points. So, for each of these, we had to express the function in the form of ax plus p all squared plus q's by completing the square, and then looking at whether it was a maximum or minimum. So, completing the square, remember, we halved that uh, coefficient of x, then we subtracted the correction number. And from there, the turning point, you take that number and you change the sign and you keep that number as it is. So for this one here, you'd have negative 3, negative 9. We did more examples. We did loads and loads. There was about 614 examples of this and we just worked our way through them. For this one though, remember we need the coefficient of x squared to be 1. But in this case, it was 4. Oh no! So what we do is we take out 4 as a common factor. And we can do it for this number as well. So taking out 4 gives us x squared plus 2x, and that takes us back to the dead easy examples. So keeping in the square brackets and working just with what's inside them, you've got x plus half that coefficient, so we've got x plus 1 all squared, square 1 and take it away, and then you can multiply out the square brackets. So we've got 4 bracket, x plus 1 all squared minus 4. Again, the turning point, take the number in the brackets and change the sign and keep the number that's on its own just as it is. We did more examples with that. Again, the coefficient of x squared was not 1, it was 3, so take out 3 as a common factor. Half the coefficient of x, remember your correction number, and the plus 5 we were just leaving as plus 5. 
After that though, when we multiplied out the square brackets, we had negative 27 plus 5, which we can simplify to negative 22. And then again, we get the turning point. This was example 11. This one was slightly different because we had a negative coefficient for x squared. So first of all, we just rewrote it. So negative x squared, take 8x plus 3. And then from there to get 1, x squared on its own, we need to get rid of that negative. So we take that out as a common factor. So taking out negative one uh, outside the square brackets, and then again, we're left with something which we can easily work with to complete the square. So that would be x add four all squared, square that and take it away, keep the negative three, and then multiply out these square brackets. And again, you can get the turning point. Doing that because you've got a negative for the x squared, it means your graph's going to be like a sad face, so it will no longer be a minimum turning point, it would be a maximum turning point. So your maximum turning point in this one would be a negative 4, 19. Again, more examples there. For this one, rewrite it first of all. We were taking out negative 2 in order to get that coefficient of 1 for x squared, and then we were just working our way through it. If you want to look back at this, just go back to lesson 2, which was looking at completing the square. Maximum and minimum of values. We already know that something squared can never be negative. So if you're asked for the maximum or minimum value of, for example, y equals x squared plus 3, well, you know the smallest possible value of something squared is zero. If you add on three, it means the minimum value for this equation here is going to be three. The maximum value, well, you could just put in x going up to infinity. And really, if you do that, y will do the same as well. So there is no maximum, but there is going to be a minimum. You cannot get a negative when you square something. We did more examples like that with this one. Again, you've got something squared. So the minimum value is going to be zero. Multiply it by five, it's still zero. Take away eight, so the minimum can drop this time to negative eight. That occurs when whatever we're squaring is equal to zero. In this case, it's x, so x would equal zero. Minimum turning point then, x is zero, y would be negative eight. So we've got zero, negative eight. With this example, again, you've got something squared, so the minimum value was zero. Then you're adding on one, so the minimum value is one. We're squaring in this case, x adds six. So the minimum is when the x adds six is equal to zero. So x would be negative six, meaning if x is negative six, y would be equal to one, giving us that minimum turning point. Here, for example, seven, y equals negative x squared. For this one, we had, we had the negative in front of x squared. Remember, if it's positive, the graph's gonna be like a smiley face, giving you a minimum. But in this case, it's a negative, which means the graph will be like a sad face. And that means you will then have a maximum. So for this one, it means the maximum value would be zero. And that is when x is zero and y would then be zero. For this one, example nine, you had y equals negative x plus three all squared minus two. For this one, again, the minimum value of x plus three all squared is gonna be zero. The negative changes it to a maximum value. And if you take away two, it would drop then to negative two. So your maximum value would be negative two. And that would occur when this bit in the brackets is equal to zero, so x would be negative three. We did quite a few examples like that. This one here was the exact same, but we had to complete the square first of all in order to get the x plus or minus something all squared and then just a number on the end. We were then thinking about it with fractions. I gave you this problem here, which fraction is larger? Well, the fraction is larger for the lower denominator. So obviously in this case, a half is larger than a seventh. So you can find out the maximum value of a fraction when the denominator is at a minimum. Meaning then, if you had this function here, y equals four over x squared plus x, x plus 11, you can say that the maximum value of the fraction will occur when the denominator is at a minimum. So go back to what we did in the first few examples and find the minimum value of x squared plus x, x plus 11. Doing that, you'll find out the minimum value will be two when x is negative three, meaning then that in this fraction, if you sub two back in for the denominator, you'd have four divided by two, which works out to be two. So the maximum value of this fraction is going to be two. And that would occur when x is negative three. 
We're then looking at sol solving quadratic equations, something which we have done, but I threw this lesson in to show you the different ways as a quick recap, and it also included completing the square. So different ways to solve a quadratic, you could graph it, you could factorize, you could use a quadratic formula, yes, and you can complete the square. So solving it by uh, using a graph, all you want to do is you want to look and see where the graph crosses the x-axis. This one's here, so it's crossing at negative 3 and 5, so it means the solution would be x is negative 3, x is 5. Dead easy. This one solving by factorising. I was showing you how I would do factorising. So this bit, I would just go off to the side to work this out. And then you're just back to um, subbing in whatever you get when you factorise. So the 6x squared plus x minus 15 equals 0 would become 3x plus 5 bracket 2x minus 3. And then from there, set each bracket equal to zero, but doink, but doink, and solve for x. So you would end up with these two roots. You can solve it using a quadratic formula. Again, this is a recap. You have used this before, but you've got negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Write down the coefficients of x squared x and the number that's on its own. So you've got a, b, and c, and then sub them in to that quadratic formula. Again, you will end up with a couple of values most of the time. Example five. Again, this isn't every single example, so go back to that lesson if you're wanting to see more. But if you want to solve this by completing the square, then you've got to obviously, first of all, complete the square. So you've got x minus half that coefficient, which is 3, square it, take it away, simplify that, and you would get x minus 3 all squared, take 10 is 0. To solve this, add 10 to both sides, so x take 3 all squared equals 10, and then you're wanting to get the x on its own, so you need to undo everything else that you're doing. You're subtracting 3 and you're squaring it. So undo the square, which is a square root, just like that. But remember, when you take the square root, it's either going to be the positive or the negative. For example, the square root of 16 is 4, but it's also negative 4. So here, when you're taking the square root of 10, it'll be the positive or the negative. That will leave you with x minus 3. To undo the minus 3, you would just add 3 to both of these values. So you've got root 10 or negative root 10, and then add 3 to both of them, meaning x, again, can be these two values. We're then looking at solving a quadratic inequations. So if you have one of these signs, if you have an inequality, then you can have to solve it by using a sketch of the graph. It doesn't work if you just set it. If you just factorise and say that this bracket is bigger than zero and this bracket is bigger than zero, it doesn't work. You have to use the graph. What you want to do is you want to sketch it, and if you've got your function is bigger than zero, you want to find out where the graph is above the x-axis. Remember, for example, in here, y would equal x squared take 2x two, minus 15. So really, you're saying y is bigger than zero, and y is bigger than zero above the x-axis. So that is the range that you would look for. If instead you were wanting to solve for example, x squared take 2x take 15 is less than 0. Well, here really y would be less than 0, which is below the x-axis. So that is what you would look for. We did a few examples like that. So you're starting off just setting it equal to 0. You're thinking if it was equal to 0, factorize, solve for x. So you work out the two roots, in this case, negative 3 and 5. But then you want to go back and you want to think, right, well, it's not equal to 0. It's bigger than 0. And again, you want to think, right, well, it's bigger than uh, 0 above the x-axis. And these are the two points on the graph that are above the x-axis. Just be very careful if it says above, uh, sorry, bigger than or bigger than or equal to. In this case, it's obviously saying bigger than 0. So it's bigger than 0 when x would be less than negative 3. Or when x is bigger than 5. So you will end up with two answers there. We did some more examples with that. In this case, you had 15 plus 2x minus x squared is bigger than or equal to 7. Here you had a negative for the coefficient of x squared. So you're best to rearrange that first of all. If you add x squared to both sides, subtract 2x and subtract 15, then you can rearrange it to end up with this. And that is the one you are now working with. That is the exact same, but we've just rearranged it. So again, set it equal to 0. 
factorize and solve for x, so we work out the two roots. And in this case, we're working out with this, we're working with this one that we've rearranged. We're wanting to find when it's going to be less than zero, and it's less, sorry, less than or equal to zero, and it's less than when the graph is below or on the x axis. And I'm saying on because you've also got that equal to zero. So in this case, it would be below when x was between negative two and four. So when x is bigger than or equal to negative two and less than or equal to four. We then went on to look at the discriminant. There was a couple of lessons on that. And this was just a recap from what you already know. Um, with your quadratic formula, this part in here, the b squared minus 4ac, is known as the discriminant, something which James absolutely loves. So from that, what's the purpose? Well, it's to work out the nature of the roots of your quadratic. If you work out b squared minus 4ac and you get something less than zero, then it means there are no real roots. If you b squared minus 4ac equals zero, it means the roots are real and equal. And b squared minus 4ac is bigger than zero, there are two real and distinct roots. And as you can see here, if it's less than zero, it doesn't touch the x-axis. If it equals zero, it touches just in one place. And if it's bigger than zero, you will have two points of contact. Find the nature of the roots of this uh, equation here. So to do that, work out the values of a, b, and c, the coefficients of x squared, x, and the number that's on its own. In this case, you've got negative seven. So since b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, there are no real roots. Again, I'm skipping lots of these examples. Go back to the individual lessons if you want to see more. This one was very similar, just slightly trickier. So work out the nature of the roots of t plus one all squared plus two t squared equals eight t. So for this one, multiply out the brackets. First of all, take everything to one side and simplify. You want it in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Once you get it into that form, you can use the discriminant. So work out the value of a, b, and c. Sub them in. In this case, we got 24. So because the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, is bigger than zero, there are two real and distinct roots. It's also worded differently to make you think for this one here, what value of p does the equation have equal roots? So here, you can write down the values of a, b, and c. C is not going to be a number, though. It's just going to be p. But we're told that it has real roots. And there are real roots when the discriminant is bigger than or equal to, remember that bit, 0. So you would say here that negative 3 squared, take 4 times 1 times p, is bigger than or equal to 0. Solve that to work out the value of p, and p would be less than or equal to 9 over 4. And that is that question answered. Example 7 there was proved that the roots of the equation there are real for all values of p. So here we weren't having to work out the discriminant. Uh, we weren't having to work out the value of p. We are told to prove that the roots are real. So to do that, we had to investigate what would happen to the discriminant. So A, B, and C, we can get just by pulling them out straight away. And we thought, right, well, the discriminant then shows us the nature of the roots. So let's work out what it would be. And we end up with P squared plus 24. We can't go any further with that. We can't work out a number, but we, can't, but we do know that if we square P, then we're always going to get zero or above because we're squaring something. So for this example here, p squared would be bigger than or equal to zero for all values of p. And if you add on 24, well, it's definitely going to be a positive number, meaning then that the values will always be real for any value of p that you sub in there. Example eight show that the roots of that equation are real for all values of k. Once again, you had to write down the value of a, b, and c, and investigate b squared minus 4ac. Subbing that in, that was again a bit trickier. Be careful with the negatives, be careful when you're multiplying out, and we ended up getting down to k squared plus 4k plus 4. Factorizing that gave us k plus 2 all squared, and again, what that means is that, well, remember, when you square something, the smallest value you can get 
is zero. You're never going to get a negative result whenever you square something. So because of that, you can say that it would always be bigger than or equal to zero, meaning then that the discriminant will be bigger than or equal to zero, so the roots will always, 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 always be real. Again, another example here, we had to find the value of m if x squared plus mx minus 5 all squared equals 9 has equal roots. So, for that one, we started off just multiplying out the brackets. We had to take everything over to one side, so we got it in the form of something x squared minus something times x plus something equals 0. Write down the values of a, b, and c. Again, look back to the question. Whenever you've got one of these discriminant questions, or when it's talking about roots, we were told that there are equal roots. And there are equal roots when the discriminant equals zero. So we can't write that down unless we know it. And in this case, we do. So b squared minus 4ac equals zero. Sub in the values of a, b, and c, and we'd end up with two values, two possible values of m by solving that. We then looked at another purpose of the discriminant. So as well as determining the nature of the roots of a quadratic, it can also be used to determine whether a line touches a curve or not. So in this case here, if the discriminant is less than zero, well, the line does not intersect the curve. They do not touch, as you can see. If the discriminant equals zero, then that means the line is a tangent to the curve. So there will be one point of contact. And if the determinant is bigger than zero, then it is going to intersect in a couple of places, as you can see here. We were looking at this example one, prove that that line is a tangent to the parabola and find the point of intersection. To do that, you need to substitute the equation of the straight line into the equation of the curve. So here, y equals 2x minus 1, sub that in here, so replace y with 2x minus 1, and we know x squared would equal 2x take 1. Rearrange that so we have it in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, and we want to solve that. As I was saying, when we did this, there were two different ways. One way is to use the discriminant, so b squared minus 4ac, work out the value. Because you get zero, it means the line is a tangent. From there, you can then factorize the x squared take 2x plus 1 equals zero to get the value of x. Sub that into one of the equations to get the value of y, and just double check it works for the other equation just to confirm you are correct. You could also have said, well, if I factorize that, I only get one value out. I've only got x equals 1, so because there's just one point of contact, it means the line will definitely be a tangent. There were more examples like that, and then we went on to this one. Find the value of c for which the line y equals 5x plus c is a tangent to the parabola. y equals 2x squared plus x minus 5. So for this one, again, because you know the line is a tangent to the parabola, you can sub it in. So sub the equation of the... Uh, line into the equation of the parabola. So we know y equals 5x plus c, so replace y with 5x plus c. So in other words, all of this would equal 5x plus c. Rearrange it so you've got something x squared, something x, and then a number. In this case, the constant will be the negative 5 take c. And for the line to be a tangent, there can only be one point of contact. So you know that the discriminant must equal 0. So write down the values of a, b, and c and then you can multiply it out, set it equal to zero, and solve for c. So c would equal, in this case, negative seven. There were more examples. We had a couple of trickier ones towards the end. Uh, for this, find the equation of the tangent to y equals x squared plus one that has a gradient of two. So a tangent is a straight line, which is in the form y equals mx plus c, but in this example, we knew the gradient was two. So the tangent must be of the form y equals two x plus c. Again, you've got the equation of the straight line, you've got the equation of the um, the curve, so you can sub that in, and you've got x squared plus one equals two x plus c. Rearrange that, and then you know that the line will be a tangent, it tells you that there, so you can set the discriminant equal to zero, Sub in the values of a, b, and c from this quadratic that you came up with when you rearranged, and you work out the value of c. c is going to be 0, so you know the equation of the tangent will just be y equals 2x plus 0, or in other words, y equals 2x. 
The last example was very similar to that one that I just talked over there. But find the equation of the tangents from 0, negative 2 to that curve y equals 8x squared. Again, it says tangent, it's a straight line, so you know y equals mx plus c. In this case, the c, the y-intercept, is negative 2. So you know your straight line will be of the form y equals mx minus 2. We've got the equation of the curve, we've got the equation of the tangent, sub them in, rearrange them to end up with the quadratic. After that, because it's a tangent, the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac equals 0, so you can sub in a, b, and c. Subbing them in, you find out that m, this missing value in here, is going to be 8 or negative 8, meaning then that the straight line will be of the form y equals 8x minus 2 or y equals negative 8x minus 2, and you'll get these two values. That's a very quick review of quadratics, or maybe not that quick, but hopefully it does make sense. Anything you are unsure of though, though, go back to the individual lessons and watch them over and over and over, and let me know if you need a hand. Good luck, have fun, see you on integration. Bye!